Yeah, I've lived in Los Gatos for 25 years. I originally got my PhD in mathematics, and uh, then I mutated into a computer science professor at San Jose State, and I was there for the last 20 years. But uh, really, my main interest has been writing uh, to some extent. You can get a lot of books published, but you still don't make very much money. <laughs> and uh, so teaching was my day job. Uh, I published some popular science books on the fourth dimension and infinity, the meaning of computers. But the main, uh, really my, I guess my main, my heart is with the, the novels that I write. And these are science fiction novels, though perhaps not science fiction in the sense that you might usually think of. Um, originally, the f I was in the cyberpunk movement in the 1980s. And since then, I started writing a... Uh, kind of science fiction that I call transrealism. And uh, transrealism, there's sort of two elements to it. It's the trans and the real. <laughs> the real part is that uh, I write about people I know, and uh, I try to have realistic characters, and I write about scenes that are familiar to me. So a number of my novels are, in fact, set in Los Gatos. And the trans part is to go beyond ordinary reality, I add science fictional elements. And in a way, science fiction is not so different from fairy tales. And something like uh, time travel, in a way, it stands for the idea of memory and nostalgia. Uh, aliens, in a way, represent just the notion of meeting other people and how very different they are from yourself. And telepathy is sort of a symbol of the, the hope that people might actually understand what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, before I, I moved to Silicon Valley, I was living in Lynchburg, Virginia, and doing some science writing, and there's a particular kind of computer graphic that caught my fancy, and this was before I really knew anything about computers. These are these things called cellular automata, or sometimes people call them CAs for short. And this <coughs> was around 1984, I went to interview Stephen Wolfram, and uh, I, I love these patterns. They're, when you see them running, they're, they're very dynamic. They're moving very fast. The, these things would be sort of running down the screen like rain. There's actually nine little windows here. And uh, the thing about cellular automata, they take very little, uh, a very small program, but they sort of eat computation, and they, they spit out these wonderfully interesting patterns. Um, when I saw them, it was sort of like, Somebody seeing the moon, the full moon, and he turns into a werewolf. And when I saw CAs, it sort of had this, this big effect on me that I wanted to become a computer hacker. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> rather than a werewolf. <laughs> now, actually, I'd already been thinking about these patterns. I didn't realize it. My first novel, Software, is one of my better known novels. And in there, uh, to make the robots interesting, is a race of intelligent robots. I thought they should have skin that was made of plastic that was full of moving colors, which in a way is like cellular automata. Now, this is a, a particularly pretty cellular automaton pattern. And this is an example of a word that I started using when I got to California, gnarly. <laughs> okay. And uh, when I use gnarly about these patterns, there's sort of two things I'm thinking about. One is. Uh, a pattern that's too orderly, like a checkerboard, is sort of boring. And something that's completely messed up and fuzzed out, like uh, static or chaos or, or fog, is not very interesting. The zone that's interesting is the in-between zone, like life. Okay? Life is not too orderly. It's not too disorderly. It's just right. It's gnarly. <laughs> and another aspect of gnarly programs like this is that they're generated from a very small seed. Like an acorn can grow an oak tree, a cellular automaton program is very small. A person's DNA is small, but it grows into a human being. Now, um, I was doing uh, OK in Lynchburg. I was working as a freelance writer, but, well, I, I wasn't really making enough money because we had three children, and uh, they were going to need braces. They are going to need to go to college. It, it wasn't working. And so uh, I went back to teaching, and I found an opening at San Jose State in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, which were the same department back then in 1986. 
And I got there, and they said, if you like, you can teach computer science instead of math. You know, it's, it's not any harder than math. <laughs> so I started teaching computer science, and course by course, I kind of learned about it. And, uh, <laughs> and the students liked me. I, they'd say, we can't do the homework. I'd say, I can't do it either. <laughs> I'd say, you're a good guy. Yeah. So, but we liked Los Gatos. We settled into Los Gatos. And the thing in Los Gatos that, one of the things that impressed me was the high school. It's the, this beautiful landmark. And uh, it always reminded me of the high school where Archie and Veronica go, the Riverdale High. It's very beautiful, big lawn. I thought, cool. So my wife and I and our three children moved here, and the kids went to the school there. Um, Another thing I liked about being here was that we were close to Santa Cruz. And uh, we go down to Santa Cruz even now, probably every, every couple of weeks. When we moved here in 86, I had the idea that I could learn surfing, and I got a surfboard and a wetsuit. But at that point, I was 40, and I think it was too late. And so I never really mastered it. But I always liked the idea of surfing. I liked the ocean. I liked the gnarliness of the ocean. And to me, surfing, it's sort of a nice metaphor for what a writer does or a computer programmer. You're sort of going out into this gnarly, confused zone day after day, and you're trying to get some balance, trying to carve some beautiful patterns into it. Now, after I started working at San Jose State, uh, I made some friends in Silicon Valley, and I met a guy called John Walker, who was the... Uh, he was one of the founders of Autodesk, and he was the CEO at that time. And that was the time Autodesk was riding high. They had a lot of money. And so Walker, I showed him some cellular automata, and he thought they were really great. And he said, well, come work for us for a couple of years. And so I did two software packages there. I did one, it was called CA Lab or with cellular automata, and the other was called Chaos. Uh, it was for James Glick's book, uh, Chaos, which was a bestseller. And that was an exciting time working up there. And these were, I just spent hundreds of hours staring at these things. People would say, what are these programs good for? Well, you stare at them for hundreds of hours and they eat your brain. So, <laughs> that's, that's, so of course, now you can't sell software like this. You can still get this, this free on my website if you want to. And then Autodesk stock went down, so I was laid out on, the, on my shield and carried out. And then I went back to teaching. So one of the first things I did, uh, I mentioned transrealism. So I wrote a transreal novel about being a computer programmer. And uh, this novel was called The Hacker and the Ants. And you can see the, they're attached there in that painting. These are all paintings that I did. I don't know if I mentioned that. That's uh, something I took up about 10 years ago. And uh, the ants were a form of something called artificial life, and they could sort of roam out into the internet, like viruses in a way, but cooler. More. And they that got into, I sort of looked ahead, and I, I realized that TVs were all going to have chips in them, so the ants got into the chips on people's TVs. And you turned on the TV, and all you would see would be ants crawling around on the screen. <laughs> and everybody was really mad at this guy, of course. They charged him with treason. <laughs> and... Uh, then I did another transreal novel, and this was called Saucer Wisdom. And this arose in a strange way. Wired Magazine wanted me to write a book of speculations about the future. For a short time, Wired was going to have a line of books. And I said, OK, I'll do that. And the reason I know what's going to happen in the future is because I have a friend who's a saucer nut. He's been abducted by UFOs many times. They've taken him to the future. He's seen the future, and he's told me, and I'm going to write it down. And uh, I had my college roommate happened to be visiting us at this point, and he's a sort of unsavory-looking character. That's his picture there. <laughs> and, and he said, uh, OK, I'll come to the meeting with you at Wired, and you can tell them that I'm your friend, the saucer nut. <laughs> so we went up to Wired. We did the pitch meeting, and, and Greg is there. And, he talks a little bit, and he says, I just I don't want to talk about it. I'm too tense. And he storms <laughs> out. And the editors were like, you know. So they said, all right, we want to publish this book. <laughs> and even after I told them it was a hoax, they said, oh, that's all right. We'll tell, 
We'll tell people it's true anyway. <laughs> you can do a Whitley Straber number. And uh, then actually they, they canceled the book line, <laughs> but I sold the book to another publisher, Saucer Wisdom. It was a very trans real book. One of the characters was actually called Rudy Rucker. And nobody really got that book. They couldn't see if it was a joke or not. It was confusing. This is a, an anatomically correct picture. It's, uh, this is a novel I wrote called Spaceland, and this is set in Los Gatos. And this is right around the time of a millennium, and a middle manager gets involved with the fourth dimension, and he screws up and makes a hole in space. You know, it's like popping a soap film. And this actually happens in the Los Gatos Coffee Roasting Company in the <laughs> upper room. I, I set it there with great graphic realism. And, and this guy, his name is Joe Cube, and he has to jump into the hole, and he's holding space together heroically. Otherwise, you know, it's just going to go apart like a, a, a popped soap bubble. And then he manages to cure it. So I often think about that when I go in the roaster. <laughs> uh, at that point, I finally retired from teaching in 2004. Um, and uh, when I originally came to Silicon Valley, I'd had this idea that I was just going to have a quick look at things. I was going to write a popular science book about computers. But I sort of got so into it, it's like the cover story ate my personality. I became a professor, I became a programmer. And finally I had a chance to step back and think, what have I been doing for the last 20 years or so? What is the meaning of computation? And so in this book, <laughs> I was sort of arguing that everything in the world, it's a game you can play, a head game. You can say, I can think of e every object in the world as being a computation and perhaps a quantum computation or a biocomputation. And of course, these are all gnarly computations. They're not too simple, they're not too complex. And uh, the title, it's sort of a, a triad, like a dialectic thing with thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And the idea is the thesis, the life box, is the idea that it was an idea I've had, and this is an idea, I, I, I keep expecting it to become a big commercial idea. People like to write their memoirs, and then they find they're not able to write. So the way to do it is to make a website that sort of has a lot of data about you, a lot of memories. And there are some people making efforts in these directions. But uh, so that you get this sort of big database of all your letters, uh, your diaries, or tapes of you talking. And that's the life box. And then if you have a good search engine, you can make it sort of behave a little bit like you. People can ask it questions. It can dig up an answer that would be something you would have said. So it creates an illusion. But then the, the hard part is, can I animate it and make it start actually being alive? And that's where we say, well, the thesis is the life box, but the antithesis is the soul. I say, I've got this soul. You know, I have this personality. I can't be imitated by a search engine on a database. And then the synthesis is this idea, maybe there is some simple program that actually can do this. And that picture at the top, it's a little hard to tell what that is. That's a cone shell, which is a certain type of uh, shell that lives in the South Pacific. And uh, the interesting thing about cone shells is they have these amazing patterns. And yet, uh, that pattern, it turns out, is generated by a simple cellular automaton rule. So our old friend, the cellular automaton, comes back in there. And so there's this hope that maybe there is a simple way to generate things like a soul from a database. Now, finally, I'll mention two books that I wrote uh, recently. One is called Post Singular, and the other is called Hylozoic. And I wrote Post Singular partly because, as a science fiction writer, I've known about the idea of the singularity for a long time. And I get sort of annoyed when I hear people talking about it so much. So I thought, I'm going to leapfrog them, so I'm going to write a book called Post Singular. <laughs> I'm going to go beyond it. And the idea I got into there was that you can actually, and in Hylozoic, the thing I got into is that we can actually think of matter as being computation. And there's this old philosophical doctrine. This is a genuine uh, Wikipedia word, Hylozoism. And it's the philosophical belief that everything is alive. And not in some vague sense, but in a literal sense, that there's some sense in which a stone is alive. We haven't figured out how to talk to it, but maybe we will. And once we can talk to it, maybe we can figure out how to program it and tweak it. <laughs> and you can even tweak the laws of physics, you know. 
and instead of you getting high, your house gets high. Right? <laughs> and, and it's a cool place to be. <laughs> so uh, that's what's, what we're going to be doing in about 100 years. We're not going to be, we're going to go beyond the biotech, and we're going to be doing the Hylozoic thing and programming matter. Okay, now that's about the end. That's what I looked like about 40 years ago. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I just recently wrote my autobiography. That was another thing I wanted to do after I retired. And it's called uh, Nested Scrolls in Honor of Cellular Automata. Okay, so that's it. It was great to be here. And thanks, Jonathan, for organizing this. <laughs>